Hello. Welcome to a special recorded version of The Legend of the Legendary League, a presentation that was created in collaboration between Crawfordsville District Public Library and the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County. Uh, this presentation was originally conceived of in 2019 as we prepared for the centennial celebration of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And uh, I am currently presenting to you, my name is Shelby Hoover, and I'm a reference assistant here at Crawfordsville Public Library. But I am not the only one who worked on this project. Um, I was assisted or led, even, you could say, um, by my peers, Stephanie Kane, who is located at the General Lou Wallace and Study, um, Nick Hedrick, who is a reporter at the Journal Review, and then we were all mentored, of course, by um, Helen Hudson, the current president of the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County and uh, a cultural icon of Crawfordsville. So the presentation, like I said, uh, was created as a way of us celebrating the centennial anniversary of um, women's right to vote being passed, but also uh, we wanted to create a presentation that explored some of the figures that have been forgotten to history or overlooked um, in narratives provided by previous researchers. And we wanted to also bring the view down from a national level um, to a state and then local citywide level, looking at suffrage, how that came about, um, and sort of what the domino effects were of women gaining the right to vote. And then also we the, the last thing that you're gonna notice um, we revisit throughout the presentation is the idea that the fight for suffrage is not over, that um, universal voting rights are not yet realized in the United States and that there is still a lot of progress to be made um, in many ways uh, across the board for civil rights, voting rights, etc. So we really hope that you enjoy this presentation. Even though we're no longer delivering this live, um, you're always welcome to reach out to our library staff with questions or comments, interests, um, things that you would like to see us revisit or go into more detail or depth about. We would love to hear from you. And there will be contact information shared at the end for how you can do so. Or you can always just find us online at our website or on our Facebook page. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into the presentation. I really hope you enjoy. The 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution reads that the rights of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. A century ago, those were just words on paper, and the reality of acknowledging that women had the right to vote in every state for any candidate that they wanted to meant convincing the majority of the United States Senate and House of Representatives at the time, made up nearly entirely of men, to update the Constitution to share their power. And so surprisingly, um, one of the first things learn tonight that maybe a lot of people don't realize is that there was a woman in Congress at the time of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, and her name was Jeanette Rankin. Um, and she was an enthusiastic supporter of women's rights to vote. You see her here on the screen. Um, we actually have access to this really lovely series of photographs of her standing here in front of the Capitol. It must have been um, around her inauguration time. Um, but she's just such an interesting figure. Of course, she's got the quote up here that she wants to be remembered as the only woman who ever voted to give women the right to vote, and she is. Um, so just such a cool way to kick things off. She was in Congress, and she did vote to give women the right to vote. Um, it really cannot be overstated how much the suffragists uh, at this time were driven to make the 19th Amendment and those words on paper that we just referenced a reality. If their proposal made it through the trials of Congress, uh, the focus for ratification would then turn towards convincing states themselves. And in 1919, there were only 48 states. Three-fourths of the state legislatures at that time had to say yes for the Constitution to be updated. So that meant that the magic number needed for ratification for this amendment was 36 states. And women had already won the power to vote in 30 states more or less by this time. So, with six states to go, the field was set for a final tumultuous push towards ratification, but our suffragists that we're going to be introduced to throughout this presentation knew that it was not going to be an easy final leg of the journey. This past August marked a century since women's suffrage became law of the land, 
And while we often think of it as just another date in history, um, maybe some of our modern audiences is not even aware of that date or what it signifies or how long we've had the right to vote as women in this country. Um, but to the people who were in the middle of this fight uh, a century ago and to people who continue to struggle to keep this importance alive in the minds of our society, um, this was the culmination of 72 years of hard and unrelenting work on the part of suffragists. And frankly, the 72 years is an underestimation. Um, women had been fighting clearly for decades, if not centuries, um, to get to the point where they were able to get the right to vote. So really quite a lot of work had gone into what we're about to talk about. So our modern audience might be asking the question, why were those decades of struggle necessary? Especially when we consider and think about the fact that our founding fathers um, petitioned a tyrant, King George, for political representation as they created our country and they railed against being held to laws that they had no say in creating. And so with that in mind, why didn't they build universal suffrage into our constitution as they drafted um, you know, an entirely new form of government for their nation? Well, many of our founders believed that challenging the status quo by considering extending voting rights to women or to other groups like men who did not own property, that that would lead to the masses demanding the vote, essentially that that would open up voting to everyone, <laughs> which they wanted to avoid. Um, and this was despite the fact that it was not unheard of in some New England colonies like New York, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire for women to have voting rights prior to the American Revolution. All of those colonies wrote women out of power as they drafted their new state constitutions. In a letter to James Sullivan, John Adams wrote, quote, there will be no end of it. New claims will arise, women will demand a vote, and every man who has not a farthing will demand an equal voice with any other in all acts of state. Adams concluded that it will confound and destroy all distinctions and prostrate all ranks to one common level. A popular mentality at the time that complemented Adams, Adams's view was that women didn't need official political representation and rather that their power and influence resided in raising morally sound sons who would then shape morally sound policies. The framers of the Constitution ultimately deflected this matter by leaving the decision for individual states to make. And remarkably, any individual of age worth at least 50 pounds, including women, had full voting rights in New Jersey until 1807 when the rights were taken away from them. So before we move on, I just think it's really valuable as well to compare these two quotes between um, Abig Abigail and John Adams, one of our original American power couples. Abigail, in a letter to John, um, writes this very famous quote to him about remember the ladies and be more generous than your ancestors have been. You know, don't put unlimited power in the hands of husbands. Remember, John, that all men would be tyrants if they could. And John, meanwhile, is writing letters where he says things about masculine systems and in practice, you know, we are the subjects, we have only the name of masters. Essentially, he's making the argument that women really do have the real power, even if they don't have the actual representation, which is just rubbish. And moving on here, you can see an illustration of women in New Jersey voting in the good old times, again, before those rights were taken away from them. So just crazy um, how this story does not reflect, I think, kind of the mainstream ideas of how women got rights, the fact that they were voting and then those rights were taken away from them um, and then they had to fight for it again. I just find that crazy. So anyway, moving on. I think it's also really valuable one more time for us to just orient ourselves along the American history timeline before we proceed any deeper. As our nation uh, is being born in the late 1700s, and with it our new idealistic form of government, at least for property-owning white men, the matter of women's rights was essentially brushed off onto the states when our constitution was ratified in 1788. And as we just heard, some states granted women rights um, in certain limited ways, and some did not. 
Four decades later, the early suffrage movement had gained enough steam to hold a well-attended convention in Seneca Falls in 1848. However, progress on the matter was severely slowed by the outbreak of the Civil War in the early 1860s, and then um, progress really slowed even further as the war concluded and as the 14th Amendment, which grants black men the right to vote, was ratified. Why did that slow things even further? We will talk about that a bit more in depth, but essentially um, we can summarize it by saying that really serious disagreement broke out between suffragists and abolitionists on the matter of who should receive the vote first. So the next 30 years essentially would see really very little progress on the national scale in favor of suffrage. Um, but women were rallying and organizing mightily during this period just sort of more behind the scenes. But by 1912, so by 1912, the momentum that had begun at Seneca Falls in the 19th century was up to full speed. And over 20,000 supporters traveled from all over the country to attend one of the largest marches for suffrage held in New York City. Only five years later, members of Alice Paul's Silent Sentinels would begin a constant picket of the White House challenging President Woodrow Wilson to face their growing movement. Though the amendment passed Congress in 1919, the final year of pushing toward ratification would be full of turbulence, especially as the nationwide push began to focus in on Tennessee exclusively. So let's go to the beginning of all of this and start. The suffragettes were inspired by the words of Mary Wollstonecraft, who was the mother of Frankenstein author Mary Shelley. In the 18th century, Mary Wollstonecraft argued that if women could have access to a proper education, they wouldn't appear naturally inferior to men. The critics at the time dismissed her as a prostitute and, quote, a hyena in petticoats. The public insults and belittlement that Mary received for believing that women have the same right as men do to an education were but only one example of the unjust treatment that women could expect in a society in which they had almost no real representation and power. Imagine for just one moment how deeply changed your life would be if you lived as a woman at this point in history. If you were poor, it might be necessary for you to work outside of your home and that would give you some amount of self-determination and independence. But most women of the middle and upper classes were really expected to think about and care only for their homes and their families and their small social circles. Once you were married, you really lost all rights to your own property and money. You could not legally represent yourself or make any legal decisions by signing a contract. You could not vote and express your opinion on local or national matters. You would likely be either discouraged or prohibited by family from seeking education or cultivating professional interests. Your friend choices would very likely be limited, your available um, and acceptable hobbies would be limited, and your ability to express yourself and explore your own personality and your identity would be highly restricted to seriously gendered boundaries. The model woman of the time was expected to be the angel in the house and little else. They were, essentially, non-existent as civic figures in American society. This was the background against which the fight for universal suffrage began. And here we can see um, just one more illustration of sort of what the model woman of the time would have been acting like and looking like and um, how she would have performed in the household, which was mainly as a support uh, to any men <laughs> in, in, in the in the home. Our suffrage movement really kicks off in 1848 um, when hundreds gather at a church in Seneca Falls, New York, where major activist Elizabeth Cady Stanton presented a document calling for women to be allowed into the voting booth. The document was signed at the time by 68 women and 32 men. Elizabeth came to Seneca Falls with a long resume in social movements. As a child, she cut out laws that she deemed unequal to women from her father's law books. And as an adult, she spoke out against the consumption of alcohol, and she and her husband and cousin were all abolitionists. Just after the Civil War, 
Elizabeth became the first woman ever to run for Congress, receiving only 24 votes. Her platform was free speech, free press, free men, and free trade, what she called the cardinal points of democracy. On the other hand, her opponent, and the one who beat her and won the race, was later censured for attempted bribery. The mainstream suffrage movement of the time and its leaders were not without fault. Elizabeth and fellow Seneca Falls pioneer Susan B. Anthony opposed legal protections and voting rights for black men until women could vote, which caused a major fracture between white and black supporters of the movement. Additionally, um, it was sadly very not uncommon for black suffragists and other suffragists of color to be forced to march separately from whites in parades, to be excluded from joining in entirely, or to experience racist interactions with white suffragists at gatherings and events. The conflict that arose between the two movements over the 15th Amendment and the question of who would be enfranchised first was not initially present in the relationships between the abolitionists and the suffragists. In fact, the movements actually worked side by side in antebellum America. However, even prior to the breaking of good relations between the movements, black women often struggled to have their voices heard or taken seriously, as most suffragist organizations were led by white women, and most abolitionist groups were controlled by black men. Later, we're going to hear a little bit more about a famous speech given by a black woman, which pointedly reminded her audience at the time that she too was a woman and deserved women's rights as well. Frederick Douglass famously attended the first women's convention at Seneca Falls and was well acquainted with Katie Stanton and Anthony. In 1866, during the 11th Women's Rights Convention, they would co-found the American Equal Rights Association, which would advocate for universal suffrage for American citizens regardless of sex or race, and which petitioned Congress on the matter. At the same convention where the American Equal Rights Association was founded, Francis E. W. Harper, a figure that we'll be observing more closely in a moment, addressed a crowd which included Katie Stanton and Anthony with a blistering critique of white women about the exclusions clearly felt by women of color. That speech is titled, We Are All Bound Up Together, and in it, Harper ends the speech with her remark that, if there is any class of people who need to be lifted out of their airy nothings and selfishness, it is the white women of America. The AERA would disband in 1869, only three years after its founding. One major contributing factor toward the disagreements that would envelop the group was the collaboration between Anthony, Katie Stanton, and George Francis Train, an open and well-known racist of the time who offered them assistance as they campaigned. As the 15th Amendment loomed with potential ratification on the horizon, Frederick Douglass and others like suffragist Lucy Stone heavily pushed for the AERA and the movement in general to seize hold of the proximity of enfranchisement for one group and support the amendment. They argued that black men having the power of the ballot would make the journey towards suffrage for women pass all the more quickly. Anthony and Katie Stanton, along with their followers, couldn't have disagreed more sharply, arguing that their efforts should turn toward pushing for women and non-whites to receive the vote at the same time. This rift would effectively halt progress on the issue of women's suffrage until the turn of the century, while black men in the South would enjoy their new power to vote only briefly before the systems of white supremacy began to work to keep them from doing so. Black suffragists like Adela Hunt Logan received a hostile reception from their white colleagues. Adela was a teacher educated in Atlanta who went on to teach at Tuskegee University in Alabama where she became friends with founder Booker T. Washington. Hunt Logan passionately supported women's voting rights in order to influence education policies, and she was an early activist who wrote to raise awareness about the discrimination that African Americans experienced from police and the courts in the South, and remember, this was in the late 1800s that she was writing about these topics. Having mixed racial ancestry, Hunt Logan was able to attend whites only NASA conventions in the South by passing herself off as white. 
Sadly, however, um, the emotional toll of those experiences and her overall experience with the suffrage movement were contributing factors in her eventual deep depression and suicide only four years before the passing of the 19th Amendment. Journalist Ida B. Wells Barnett is likely very familiar to our audience, and she also locked horns with movement leaders over her opposition to racial segregation. Born into slavery, Ida reported extensively on the premeditated lynchings of African Americans across the South after the Civil War. Excluded from the mainstream suffragist movement because of her race, Wells would go on to found the National Association of Colored Women's Club, alongside other suffragists such as Mary Church Terrell, Rosa Parks, and Harriet Tubman, and she was present at the founding of the NAACP. One of the few black women welcomed at meetings with white suffragists early on was another teacher, Mary Church Terrell. Mary would go on to form her own suffrage group eventually that was exclusively for black women, and years after the 19th Amendment was won, became active in the civil rights movement of the mid-1900s. She was educated at Oberlin College, and um, in addition to her suffrage work, she did work with Ida B. Wells on her anti-lynching efforts. And um, Terrell was also known as a civil rights activist 100 years before the official civil rights movement in late 19th century Washington, D.C., which is just an amazing um, sort of life career of being involved in the fight for civil rights. A century before that civil rights movement and before Rosa Parks became the face of the Montgomery bus boycott, activist Frances Ellen Watkins Harper also refused to give up her trolley seat to a white person in Philadelphia. Frances was known as the mother of African American journalism, and she became one of the first black writers to have her work printed in the United States. By the time of her death in 1911, she had written over 15 novels and poetry collections, many of them um, with reflections on themes of suffrage and civil rights. Harper went on to multiple public speaking tours uh, where she spoke always in favor of abolish abolition, temperance, and suffrage. And this is so cool. She reportedly sent funds that she raised from her speaking engagements to support the efforts of the Underground Railroad. A very early pioneer in the field of women's rights Sojourner Truth was born into slavery in northern New York State in 1797. Born with the name Isabella Bomfrey, she would go on to have five children while enslaved before escaping to freedom. And she would go on to successfully sue a white man for illegally selling her son into slavery in the South. And she won and was reunited with her child. Truth would speak publicly and advocate for her views on temperance, abolition, and women's rights for most of her life. And here's um, the point where we normally would pause our presentation with a live audience to watch a short video clip, which addresses some um, misconceptions that we have in our modern day culture about Sojourner Truth and a very famous speech that she was given which was recorded uh, by a white woman in, a, in an inauthentic way, to say the least. We will likely do a separate short video on this topic um, where we will play a clip of that speech as it's meant to be heard and talk about the version of it that has made its way into um, American history and culture and kind of why that's concerning and not great. So just be aware, uh, Sojourner was an excellent and amazing suffragist in her own right, and do look out for more information to come about her in separate videos in the future. Other women of color played visible roles in the movement as well. For example, Dr. Mabel Pingwa Lee, who had immigrated to the U.S. from Hong Kong as a young girl, became well known as a suffragist in New York City. At the age of just 16, as she was preparing to begin at Barnard College, she led a 1912 suffrage parade in New York on horseback and was featured in an article in the New York Tribune about the march. However, sadly, Lee knew that her activism would not directly benefit her, as she wouldn't be allowed to vote until the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed, which it finally was, 
During World War II, Chinese immigrants were not the only ones who experienced this unjust treatment. The 19th Amendment did not fully enfranchise Black, Asian American, Hispanic American, and Native American women. And many would continue to face barriers erected by white voters that were designed to discourage or fully bar non-whites from voting. Those tactics ranged from nearly impossible literacy tests to poll taxes to intimidation tactics, etc. Native Americans had a champion at the time in Suzette Lafleche Tibbles, who became known as Bright Eyes. She is remembered as the first woman to speak out for Native American rights and delivered lectures around the world and spoke to government committees about extending rights to indigenous peoples of all kinds. Suffragists also raised their voices outside the mainland United States. In the Hawaii Territory, Wilhelmina Kekelau Kalani Nui Weidman Dowsett successfully fought to allow residents to vote for women's suffrage. Lawmakers had been prohibited from granting voting rights to women before the 19th Amendment was ratified in this territory. Puerto Rico was a U.S. territory by this time, and the suffrage movement found voices and leaders there as well. Milagros Benet de Newton corresponded and learned from suffrage leaders leading the movement in the U.S., and she led the push for women's voting rights in the territory. Puerto Rican women were not included when the 19th Amer Amendment was ratified. Newton became president of the Suffragist League in 1920 and continued to push for full suffrage, which would be partially realized in 1929 for literate women, and then fully realized in 1932 when near universal suffrage was granted. I say near because Puerto Ricans still cannot vote in presidential elections in the United States. Back in the lower 48, Suffrage leader Mary Garrett Hay became one of the first women in the eastern United States to join a political party, and she encouraged Republicans to support women's voting rights. Another super interesting figure is Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, who was one of the first women to become a physician in our country, and she graduated from Syracuse Medical College in 1855. Walker went on to serve as a field surgeon in the Civil War and at one point was captured by Confederate troops where she spent four months in prisons and was questioned as a potential spy. Walker spent her early life wearing a hybrid outfit uh, that was sort of between bloomers and a dress, but she eventually switched to wearing entirely male attire during her war service just because of the convenience of it. She experienced very serious abuse throughout her life because of her preference to dress this way, and she was arrested frequently and questioned as a potential homosexual because of that. At the end of her war service, she was presented with a Medal of Honor, and get this, she is the only woman in American history to ever be awarded the honor. And she reportedly wore that medal every day until her death. Sadly, her medal was revoked from her in 1917, two years before her death, just because Congress was removing medals from those who didn't um, experience actual enemy combat. But thankfully, it was restored to her in 1977 under the Carter administration. And side note, even though it was revoked from her, remember what I said where she wore it every day until her death? She did not return it. She was not going to give that thing back, which I just love. Fighting for women's suffrage was just part of the legacy of Jane Addams, who founded Whole House in Chicago. There, educated women shared knowledge with low-income families in their neighborhoods, and Jane also helped bring juvenile court systems, improved sanitation, factory laws, employment protections for women, and more playgrounds and kindergartens to the city of Chicago. So awesome. Even within the United States, suffrage slowly arrived in certain areas well before 1920. Before the 19th Amendment, what parts of the ballot a woman could fill out if she was allowed to vote at all depended entirely upon where she lived. In this map that's on the screen currently, you can see the varying levels of suffrage available depending on the region that you lived in, 
So certain states like New Mexico, Louisiana, New Jersey, women could vote in some special elections like for school board, tax questions, etc. In Indiana, uh, women could vote for president, but not in other elections. And if you look up down, up south, uh, <laughs> down south and up to the northeast, you'll see that the voting booth was completely off limits. Here we can just see um, a couple of members of the Indiana Women's Franchise League in 1919 again because some some amount of suffrage was available to women and so women were organizing um, and grouping and advocating around what they could advocate for. This map from 1915 presents a more absolute view of the progress of suffrage, or you could even just say that this was um, a great propagandist view of the fight. Out west, the states in white represent full suffrage, but the women of the eastern United States are desperately reaching out for Lady Liberty and the vote that she brings them. Some of the loudest opponents to enfranchising women were actually women themselves. Anti-Sofs, as they were known, believed that allowing women to vote would hasten the nation's moral collapse, going against God's plan for the world. They thought it would threaten the purity of women and blunt the chivalry of men, and these societal expectations formed the foundation of arguments that would be used by anti-suffragists as they challenged the movement. So many anti-Sofs argued that women not only belonged in the sphere of home, but again echoing an argument that we heard earlier, that women preferred to be there because that was the seat of their true power and influence. Others claimed that suffrage was a home destroyer and that it would lead to an increase in divorce and with mothers missing from homes and their domestic positions, an increase in crime due to deteriorating values at home. In, uh, in the photo that we see right here on the screen currently, I just wanted to point out a few things to go along with this conversation. Um, because well, anti-suffs were against suffrage, but they were also against many other political <laughs> ideologies and movements at the time. And that was very well known, even if we as a modern audience can't quite pick up on some of the symbols and ideas represented in this picture, I'm gonna point out to you some things that are happening that audiences at the time that this picture was taken would have certainly understood and um, realized the meaning and significance of. So in the middle of the picture, we can see Josephine Pearson, um, and we're gonna talk about her a little bit more in a moment. She was really the main leader of the anti-suffrage movement, but she is standing right next to a veteran, um, a Confederate veteran. All of this is kind of notated down in the notes of this photograph. And then you can see on the wall behind them, portraits of Andrew and Rachel Jackson, um, which, uh, was very much bound up in um, sort of the Southern philosophy and respect for the state's rights movements and um, sla pro-slavery movements, essentially. And um, we can see even further in that direction, behind everyone, there is a Confederate flag being held up. And with that flag, there's a banner of support for Ku Klux Klan founder, Nathan Bedford Forrest. So again, um, just making this really clear that even if we as a modern audience can't quite see this, at the time people very much understood that anti-suffrage very much went hand in hand with states' rights and with less coded language, um, pro-slavery ideals. As Elaine Weiss writes in her book, The Woman's Hour, the Bible said that a woman's place was in the home as loving wife and mother, not in the dirty realm of politics, not in the polling booth or in the jury box, where her delicate sensibilities could be assaulted, her morals sullied and even corrupted. So going back to that figure that we first uh, saw in that photograph, Josephine Pearson, for her, fighting against her own right to vote was actually a promise that she made at her mother's deathbed, literally to her mother on her mother's deathbed. She promised that she would continue her mother's fight 
um, and crusade against suffrage and against women's rights. Josephine was a president um, of the Tennessee State Association opposed to women's suffrage and had suspended her teaching career to, to devote her full energy to the cause. As dean of a Christian college in Missouri, she was often the lone anti-suff in faculty meetings, which really shaped her, her views on the subject. And after she traveled to states that had already franchised women, she came to the conclusion that suffrage exposed women to the dirty business of politics without improving their lives at all. And really, opposition towards this movement went all the way to the White House. President Woodrow Wilson publicly refused to support women's voting rights, but here's where we bring in a very cool figure, suffragist Alice Paul. She wanted to change his mind. And on screen, you can see um, a book that was part of our well-read Citizen Book Club over the past year as part of the Legendary League presentations. Big recommend for this book um, if you want to learn more about the subject, specifically about what we're going to talk about next, which was the showdown between Alice Paul and Woodrow Wilson in the final years before ratification took place. It's a really great book um, that goes into the fight for the right to vote, as you can see. So Alice Paul was really inspired by the militant tactics of British suffragists, and she brought their strategies back to our country. On the eve of Wilson's inauguration in 1913, Paul organized a parade of suffragists from all 48 states uh, to come to DC um, and be part of his inaugural parade, but to, dis to disrupt it in certain ways. And all of those suffragists endured serious assaults both verbal and physical, from spectators. Alice later cut her ties with NASA to form the more radical National Women's Party, and that party trained its sights on President Wilson. Under Alice's direction, groups of women calling themselves Silent Sentinels stood in front of the White House day and night, 365 days a year, holding banners that read things like, Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? And Mr. President, how long will you make us wait? President Wilson really took exception to this unladylike behavior from Paul and her sentinels. And uh, those protesters were eventually, um, well, they eventually faced really serious repercussions. Some of them were sent to jail. Uh, Alice herself was sent to jail where she began a hunger strike. And as you can see illustrated here, she was force fed through tubes. Um, she and many other suffragists were doing this. Some of them were nearly committed to mental hospitals. It was not a great time. They were frankly tortured. And um, President Wilson directed that, and then he eventually came out in support of women's suffrage in 1917. Leading that pre-inaugural women's suffrage possession um, was a figure named Inez Milholland, who, she's so cool. She was a member of the National Women's Party and she was a human rights lawyer. At that parade, um, she donned a crown of a long white cape and she mounted a large white horse. And it's just, uh, I, I just love the photographs from that moment. I think it's so, it's just, she's such an icon. I mean, just look at her up there on her horse with her cape, it's so cool. Um, but three years after that parade, despite her poor health, she became a speaking tour across the western U.S. to push the movement forward even further. And sadly, Inez died after collapsing during a speech in Los Angeles. Her last public words were, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? At first, the Republican Party of the time refused to take sides in the debate. But Chairman Will Hayes, a Wabash College graduate and the father of a future Crawfordsville mayor, vowed to remain neutral to try to keep peace between Republicans and Democrats after a very bitter election cycle of 1912. However, Hayes did change his tune, and he believed that, Rep that Republicans had to endorse women's suffrage to continue advertising itself as a party of progress. Hayes is quoted as saying, 
democracy in the United States is really nothing but a sham unless Election Day gives all Americans the chance to express their political opinions effectively. And to hold American women bound by the result of an election, to train them in schools to think for themselves as well as a man, to accord them freedom of utterance as a constitutional right, and then attempt to deny them the opportunity to stand up and be counted on Election Day is a governmental blunder of the first magnitude. By Valentine's Day of 1920, there was light at the end of this long tunnel. Arizona had just ratified the 19th Amendment, bringing women across the nation closer to the voting booth with only five states still needed. So when the gavel fell on the convention of the American Women's Suffrage Association in Chicago, 2,000 women came to the party. The New York Tribune describes the scene, quote, over their heads, a woman's liberty bell peeled the end of the 51 years of struggle for federal women's suffrage. The women jumped on chairs waving yellow flags and blew their horns into their neighbors' faces. They laughed and they cried and they burst into hysterical little snatches of the doxology and glory, glory, hallelujah. The organization was dissolved and replaced with the League of Women Voters, a section of the group devoted to educating women about their newfound civic rights. A congratulatory telegram arrived to that conference from President Wilson. But the fight was not over yet. All eyes turned to Tennessee, the last state with an undetermined vote that was needed to enshrine the 19th Amendment into law. Elaine Weiss describes the furious lobby lobbying efforts in her recent book, The Woman's Hour, The Great Fight to Win the Vote, which was part of our 100th anniversary book club series, and also very recommended if you want to read more about this story. Three women are at the center of that book and our final chapter here. Carrie Chapman Catt, the president of the country's main suffrage association, Josephine Pearson, whose opposition to equal suffrage we covered just a bit earlier, and finally, native Tennessean Sue Shelton White. When Sue first joined the cause, her moderate views helped Tennessee's rifle su suffrage organizations join forces, but she later switched allegiances to Alice Paul's National Woman's Party, moving to the nation's capital to edit the party newspaper. She was one of the silent sentinels holding vigil outside the White House. Back home to bring the 19th Amendment across the finish line, she used hardline tactics to line up the votes. The amendment was tangled in political drama. Tennessee's governor had competition in his upcoming primary election, and he refused to call lawmakers back for a vote on ratification until after the election and only, Elaine Weiss suspects, if he won. When the special session was finally set, the amendment sailed through the Tennessee Senate, but it was not going to be that easy in the House of Representatives, and activists from both sides of the debate scrambled to get lawmakers to, um, de to decry whether they would vote yes or no. When it appeared the amendment might fail, Sue threatened to reveal the names of the flip-flopping lawmakers who were going back and forth. But in the end, it all came down to 24-year-old Representative Harry Byrne, who cast the tie-breaking vote ratifying the amendment. So let's hear a little bit about his story. Harry originally supported the amendment, but he briefly changed his vote and sided with anti-suffs when party bigwigs and misleading telegrams from constituents led him to believe that his district was opposed to equal suffrage. The deciding factor that would come down to change his vote was a letter from his widowed mother, Feb Ensminger Byrne, which he carried on him during the vote. The letter read in part, and this is one of my favorite things in this entire presentation, quote, hurrah and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. And his mother also added, don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat." Harry himself would later leave written record of his thoughts from that time, and he wrote, quote, I want to state that I changed my vote in favor of ratification, first because I do believe in full suffrage as a right, and 
I knew that a mother's advice is always safest for a boy to follow, and my mother wanted me to vote for ratification. I just love that. It's so lovely. Women here in Indiana had many people to thank for their right to vote once this all finally came to pass, and Helen Gauger was one of the figures who kept up the fight for decades. Helen was an attorney from Lafayette who defended herself at the Indiana Supreme Court when she was denied a ballot in 1894. She was inspired by the death of a woman from domestic violence and believed that the way to end abuse of women at the hands of their spouses was to vote it away. However, Helen lost her case. The Supreme Court said that its hands were tied and that the U.S. Constitution in its current form just did not extend voting rights to women. Helen would never live to see the day when it did. But, in good news, Antoinette Leach did. Two years before her death, the 19th Amendment became law. Antoinette was the first woman in Indiana to officially become a lawyer, and she was originally denied from admission to the bar, with the ruling judge citing a law that specified that, quote, those eligible for admission had to be a voter, end quote which effectively excluded all women from the profession in Indiana, obviously. The decision was appealed in the Indiana Supreme Court, and many were surprised by the progressive reversal of the decision in which the presiding judge, Justice Hackney, wrote, quote, If nature has endowed woman with wisdom, if our colleges have given her education, if her energy and her diligence have led her to a knowledge of the law, and if her ambition directs her to adopt the profession, Shall it be said that forgotten fictions must bar the door against her? Leach would go on to start the first real suffrage club in Sullivan County, and she later tried unsuccessfully to add equal voting rights to the state's constitution. A suffrage leader described her as the most capable advocate of the equal suffrage movement since Susan B. Anthony. Another really interesting local figure, May Wright Sewell, led suffrage associations and other women's organizations while teaching in Indianapolis. She and her husband founded the Girls Classical School, which is a college preparatory school. In the suffrage movement, she pioneered the council idea of bringing together women from diverse backgrounds to advocate for larger, more universal interests. Polly Strong was not a suffragist, but she played a key role in Indiana women's history. Strong was born enslaved in the Northwest Territory and was purchased by an innkeeper from Vincennes. Slavery and involuntary servitude was illegal in Indiana, so in 1820, Polly sued for her freedom. A court in Knox County ruled against her. But the case was appealed to the state Supreme Court, which declared that slavery can have no existence in Indiana, even though it did not automatically free all of the remaining slaves. Before Zitkala Saw began speaking up for the rights of Native Americans, she was educated in Indiana as well. Zitkala Saw's parents sent her to a Quaker school in Wabash. And against her family's wishes, she enrolled at Earlham College in Richmond to continue her education. Zitkala Saw founded an organization that advocated for citizenship, better education, and health care for Native Americans while recognizing and preserving their culture. Some of the state's best known suffragists have ties to our own community, which became known as the Headquarters for Women's Suffrage Movement in Hoosierdom. Crawfordsville native Elizabeth Boynton chaired a woman's suffrage convention here in 1869, and interestingly, remarks were delivered at that convention by General Lew Wallace. However, he was considered to be very condescending to the audience that day, and historian Rebecca Nicdole wrote um, in Hidden History of Montgomery County, Indiana, that a woman asked to speak after Wallace to which he replied that he supposed a woman must always have the last word. And on top of that, instead of addressing voting rights, he spoke instead about Indiana's divorce law that day. Elizabeth was also an outspoken advocate for women's education. She and two other friends, including the journalist and suffragist Mary Hannah Kraut, 
convinced Wabash College to allow them admission to physics lectures. Just hours before dying of a stroke, the campus president reportedly promised Elizabeth that she would earn a diploma, a promise that went unfulfilled. In 1868, Elizabeth was among 23 women to apply for admission to the college, but all were turned away. Lou Wallace's stepmother, Zarelva, joined the cause after becoming well-known in the temperance movement. Testifying before the Senate, she said society couldn't be reformed unless women were allowed to vote. And she told the men, quote, We do not intend to depreciate your efforts, but you have attempted to do an impossible thing, to represent the whole by one half. And because we are the other half, we ask you to recognize our rights as citizens of this republic. Dr. Mary Holloway Wilhite helped start Montgomery County Suffrage Association in the 1860s and later organized an Indiana Equal Suffrage Association's convention here in Crawfordsville. She hosted Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton at her home, which stood across from the former Burkhart Funeral Home parking lot on West Wabash Avenue. The League plans to dedicate a historical marker at the site sometime in the future it was originally meant to be done this year, but has been disrupted due to COVID. So do keep an eye out for that to be happening or possibly to have already happened. Dr. Wilhite was Crawfordsville's first female physician and one of the first women in Indiana to earn a medical degree. And her practice focused on women and children. So by the late 1940s, another group of women in the community began laying the groundwork for a local League of Women Voters. The first meeting was called by Georgia Manson, who ran a coal yard in the community. Manson invited presidents of all the local women's organizations, and officers were soon elected. The vice president, Annie Leavenworth, was at the time one of only two women who taught at Wabash College. The first order of business was to start an observer corps. Members attended government meetings to monitor the creation of local ordinances and to ensure that the city's business was being conducted in view of the public. This remains a major part of the League's activities. Members observed the meetings of at least 20 government agencies, including school boards, library boards, and the housing authority, which the League helped establish in Montgomery County. The League scored an early victory here by successfully pushing for more representation on the Crawfordsville School Board as well. The board grew to five members from three, and a woman was soon elected. Today, three women serve as school board trustees, including the League's own Susan Albrecht, Kathy Brown, and Ellen Ball. Over the years, the local League has completed a study leading to the creation of the Youth Service Bureau, reformed the city's dump and trash hauling system, helped the county reorganize the school systems in the early 1960s, recommended the creation of a city parks and recreation board, and helped successfully lobby the state to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment, which we all know, of course, fell three states short of being written into the U.S. Constitution. As longtime League member Wilma Schwartz said in the 1980s, we've gone from, quote, getting grade A milk in Crawfordsville to helping Crawfordsville redistrict. So now that we've seen the story of suffrage and the birth of the League of Women Voters, both on a national scale and a local scale, it's important for us to wrap everything up by once again revisiting the fact that the 19th Amendment did not grant voting rights to all women and all people. Um, after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, there were still major milestones that we had to get to in order to get uh, certain groups into the voting booth. And so 1924, we see the Indian Citizenship Act, which granted voting rights to Native Americans. Not until the 50s were all Asian immigrants allowed to um, claim citizenship and thus voting rights. We saw Chinese immigrants in the 40s finally receive those rights. Um, but yeah, it wasn't until the 50s that Asians in general as a group were brought into the suffrage movement entirely. And then, of course, um, the, the major civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s culminates in the Voting Rights Act, which makes it at least mm, officially wrong to 
continue things like poll taxes and intimidation. Um, and finally, the Equal Rights Amendment, which we see in the 70s, get denied. Um, certainly something important for us to keep on our minds, especially because the ERA has been resurfacing in recent years as Congress kind of maybe looks to revisit that. And in case you aren't sure what the ERA is, I really recommend you Google it. Um, it essentially is just language going into the Constitution that enshrines and guarantees uh, equal rights regardless of gender and sex, which amazingly is not in our Constitution currently. So yeah, um, major things to be aware of here and other things mentioned throughout the presentation that could have gone on here are including things like Puerto Ricans not being able to vote in national elections, etc. Ratification was not the end, the timeline continues, unfortunately. But even with that in mind, knowing that our timeline of uh, lack of voting rights continues even to today, we do see progress continuing. Um, and this map that's up here on the screen, unfortunately, is just slightly out of date. It doesn't quite capture uh, what I wanted it to, which was up through the election of, not 1918, of 2018, when we saw the quote unquote blue wave occur that brought many more women into Congress than ever before. Um, so yeah, we'll, I'll leave this up here on the screen for a moment so that you can kind of reflect on women in Congress and what that looks like. And just be aware that, of course, there have been major movements forward. Uh, just even this year, I'm speaking post November 2020 election, we saw even more women take seats in Congress this year. So like I said, the timeline continues. The story is never done. And so with that, we're nearly finished with our presentation. And as we wrap things up, you might be sitting there wondering, why does all of this matter? Why did I just sit through an hour long presentation learning about women's voting rights? Wasn't the movement a success? Wasn't everything achieved that we wanted to have achieved? Can't we just applaud suffragists and move on? And this is just history class and blah, 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 right? Like it's over. Well, not really. I mean, as you've heard me say over and over again, the timeline continues, the struggle continues, not all of our rights are realized and not everyone has access to the rights that some of us get to enjoy. The struggle to attain the vote for women was not simple, it was not quick, it was not pleasant. And it was only because of the hard work of suffragists struggling and suffering that we are able to look back at this issue and ask what we think is a simple question. Well, why did it take so long? This clarity and this consensus that we as a modern audience are likely kind of all feeling about this subject, that's a major milestone in the struggle for women's rights and in the life of our democracy. Um, and now that we're celebrating the 100th anniversary and we're past the 100th anniversary at this point, obviously, and now that we're experiencing greater levels of women's equality than ever before, it is tempting to just think all oh, the hard work is finished. The mission is accomplished. We can be done. And this just is not the case. Suffragist work is not finished in America until every single citizen can vote with convenience and without fear of intimidation. With the work still not being done, you may be wondering, well, what can I do? Many of us probably aren't well versed in constitutional law, so we can't travel long distances to volunteer for voting rights causes, and we can't argue points in court, and we may not feel like we're smart enough or wise enough to really have a place in this discussion and the work being done. And it can so easily feel like there's nothing you can do at all. But and I mean this so sincerely too, if you're listening to me. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Your time, your passion, and your engagement are the most valuable commodities that you can give to continue the work of the suffragists. One of the very first things that you can consider doing is joining the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County. And you do not have to be a woman, and you do not have to be a current and active voter to join this organization.
It doesn't matter what your political alignment or lack of alignment is. It doesn't matter what previous experience you have in being civically engaged and thinking about matters of government and politics. You don't really need to know about how any of that stuff works. When you become a member of the League of Women Voters, you become part of an important story in Montgomery County, one in which regular citizens help inform others and encourage voting engagement for the betterment of our community. And we will walk you through what that means. Don't worry, it is very simple. It is easy to get involved. What better way is there to show your love for your country and your fellow countrymen, even if you disagree with them, than to devote your time to ensuring that our constitutional rights are understood and utilized by all members of your community. So if that pitch got you fired up and ready to go, I also really urge you to consider learning more about and joining Montgomery County's Women in Network, known by the acronym WIN. Um, it is a local bipartisan organization that's working to support and encourage women in our community to participate in elected and appointed public service. WIN regularly hosts workshops and meetings um, and groups that can guide and mentor women through the process of becoming politically active leaders. Um, and even if you're just looking to make new friends and network a little bit, it's such a wonderful group. You can contact them. Um, oh yes, their, their email address is up there on the screen. So you can contact them at womenwin6 at gmail.com. That's the word women and then the word win, W-I-N, and the number six at gmail.com. Or you can visit their Facebook page their Facebook page is just Women in Network. Again, that's up there on the screen for you in case you need to see that. Um, so you've got those options, but perhaps volunteering for one of those groups just isn't quite right for you right now, which is, that's okay, no worries. There is one more thing you can do. It's a very powerful action that you can take and you can take it in nearly every election. You can vote, and I do mean every election. While national elections are always cause for excitement and everyone you know, wants to talk about voting for president and Congress, it's important to remember that voting in our local elections for our local leaders has the power to create huge changes and improvements right here in our own county. And those are changes that we can observe and benefit from every single day. So in fact, your vote may be most powerful when applied toward local elections. I really hope that you'll challenge yourself here and now as I finish, that you'll stay informed to, about the next election and our local candidates and issues, that you'll attend local candidate forums or listen to them on the radio when they come up, that you'll talk to your family members and possibly if you have them, your children or your friends who may or not be as politically active about why voting is important and why women spent nearly a century of active, difficult campaigning for their right to vote. And of course, you can always role model interest and engagement in civic topics for young people because what better hope is there for a bright future than getting our youngest generations thinking about their civic duties and involved in our community at a young age. So with that, that's really the end of our presentation. I do hope that you've enjoyed it. I know it was quite a packed hour long <laughs> lecture about suffrage and the League of Women Voters. But like I said, if you would like to see more content of this type, if you would like for us to explore different areas of this story or go further back in time or <laughs> perhaps make predictions about the future, whatever you would like to see us explore next with this, um, I certainly would like to hear about it. So again, my name was Shelby Hoover, and if you would like to reach out and talk to me more or share your ideas or your feedback in any way, um, you can reach me here at the library. You can call the reference desk and leave a message for me at any time. The phone number here is 362-2242, and the extension for the reference desk is 117. And you can also always shoot us an email. Probably the easiest email address for you to reach out to is ask. So just the word ask, A-S-K, at cdpl.lib.in.us. And I will be sure to have that email address and the phone number listed with this video, whether you're watching it on YouTube, our website, or on Facebook. With that, thank you so much for watching this presentation. I do hope that you learned a little bit of new information 
or maybe find yourself reinvigorated as you think about politics, um, government, and the future of our country. So thanks again. I hope you have a wonderful day, and we will see you in the future for more programs here at the library. Bye.